May we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this beautiful summer day. Please send your Holy Spirit to dwell within us and among us, that we may be moved to serve you, to worship you, and to love you with all our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. Hungering and thirsting, we come to the Lord. Jesus is the living bread. Feed us with your love and healing power, O Lord. Give us the bread of hope and compassion that we may also feed others. Praise be to you, O Lord, for your compassion for us. Praise be to you, O Lord, for your steadfast love. Amen. Let us join together now in singing hymn number 84, O God, our help in ages past. Hymn number 84. Let's stand together as we sing. Good morning. Samuel, you thought it was just going to be you and me there for a second, didn't you? But we've got some more friends that are down here with us. I hope everybody's doing well. Some of you are going back to school this week, and others have a few more days. I hope you enjoy the last couple of days of your summer vacation and that you've had a good time being able to be outside and play and so on. I want to um, tell you this morning about one of my favorite teachers growing up, Ms. Petty. Ms. Petty taught me in high school in 10th grade. She taught biology, and she um, really helped me understand a little bit about science, and I really enjoyed her class. And um, I've brought some bread with me today, and sometimes when I eat bread, I think about Ms. Petty. One of the things that Ms. Petty taught me in biology is a little bit about how our bodies digest food. That when we eat food, you know, our bodies take all the vitamins out of the food and the nutrients, and that's what gives us strength. And she told me that if you take a little piece of bread, something like this, 
And if you take that bread and you put it in your mouth and you just hold it in your mouth, you don't bite it, you don't chew it, you don't swallow it, but if you just keep it in your mouth long enough, what do you think will happen? Do you think it will just stay there? It will dissolve. Exactly right. It will dissolve and it will turn into something like sugar. And in that sugar, with some of this bread, now this is whole wheat bread, so this is the, the healthy kind of bread. This has some vitamins in it and some nutrients in it that if I were to eat this and it would turn into that sugar, it would give me some strength. It would give me some energy. And that's one reason why we have to eat food. Now what does that have to do with us? What does that have to do with, why are we talking about biology in the church? Well, in the passage of scripture that we are reading today, Jesus says that he is like bread and he tells us that you need to eat me now who would want to eat Jesus who would want to eat a person to eat his body and drink his blood if I if I did that would you want to do that Mac would you want to do that no that sounds gross doesn't it we don't eat each other we don't drink each other's blood that's no we don't do that kind of stuff but Jesus says, you must eat my body and drink my blood. But what he means by that is, I want you to learn from me. That I'm teaching you how to live. And as you learn from me, you will learn how to live. And you will have to learn to live in a way that will honor God and that will please God. And that will make this world a better place. Jesus has given us a comparison to like, just like we eat bread... We also eat the words that he gives us and that we learn the words that he teaches us. What are some of the things that Jesus teaches us that we need to learn to do? How about loving each other and serving each other? When we learn to love one another and serve one another, that's kind of like taking the bread and eating it and being able to make our lives stronger and better. So this week, sometime this week, you're going to have some bread. You're going to have a piece of toast. Or maybe you'll have a hamburger that'll have a bun or something. Anytime you think about bread, I want you to think about Jesus and to give thanks for the lessons that Jesus teaches us. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for teaching us. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you, God, for providing for us everything that we need to live good lives. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to accept all of the lessons that you teach us and be able to live them so that we can offer bread to others. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.
Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Generous God, you call us to the banquet of your love, to eat, to drink, to fully embrace who you are. We confess that we aren't always prepared for what that means. We have the tendency to pick and choose the parts that we like, the parts that we want to hear, and quarrel over small things, rather than wrestling with what your example of love and grace truly means, and how we are to embody it in our daily lives. Be manna in our journeys, food that gives us life. Feed us, sustain us, nurture us, empower us, and strengthen us to be banquet people, to live lives of generosity, to open our hands and hearts to all that we encounter, to invite all to taste and see your goodness and love. It's in the name of Christ, the living bread, that we pray. Amen. Let us join together now as we sing hymn number 668, Wonderful Words of Life. Hymn number 668. Let us stand.
May we pray. Truly, Lord, wonderful words of life are the gospel message that we need to proclaim. We thank you, Lord, for the beauty of this day, for the gift that you have given us of this day. We thank you, Father, for being able to return to your house and to return unto you our tithes and offering. Take them, use them, spread your word, dear Father, not only through the gifts that we give, but through the lives that we live. In Jesus' name I humbly pray. Amen. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we bow with grateful hearts for this day. We have acknowledged your presence among us, O Lord. Your spirit is here in this place. And now we ask, O Lord, that your spirit might come to feed us with your words, to direct our understanding, to empower our very lives so that we might live lives worthy of the grace that we receive in Christ as good stewards of every good gift that we receive through him. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. This will not surprise any of you, but Jesus cares a lot more about feeding the hungry than I do. This lesson, this truth, became very clear to me this weekend. Yesterday, as you know, was the third Saturday in the month of August. The third Saturday is always important here at First Baptist Church because it's on the third Saturday of each month that our church hosts the Community Cafe. Community Cafe is a partnership ministry that we hold with the Methodist and Presbyterian churches as well as a few other congregations in which we will step in the gap of the Lumberton Christian Care on the weekends and that we will provide a meal for the impoverished on the third Saturday of each month. The Methodists have another day, another Saturday of the month and the Presbyterians and and first ba the other First Baptists, they all have their Saturdays. Well, we have the third Saturday of the month. 
We've been doing this ministry now for several years. And I believe Community Cafe is one of the most important ministries that we do for our community on a monthly basis. And it's a ministry that I believe every member of our church needs to participate in at some point. You need to come down and, and help do a community cafe. Well, I knew all week long that this coming Saturday was the third Saturday of the month. This coming Saturday was our day for Community Cafe, and I even thought I knew who was responsible for Community Cafe. But I was mistaken. The persons that I thought were responsible for Community Cafe yesterday were not responsible. And it wasn't until Friday night at 8 o'clock that I realized that the class that I teach was the group that was responsible for Community Cafe. It wasn't until Friday night at 8 o'clock that I realized that back in March, I asked my Sunday school class if they would lead Community Cafe on Saturday. And to their credit, they said, sure, we'll be glad to do that. That's something we need to do. But to my fault, and I'm to blame, I totally forgot to remind them. We haven't been meeting in our room where I had put up an announcement to remind us all summer long. We haven't been meeting in there the past few weeks. And so Friday night, when I called a member of our class about a totally different matter, we began to realize, who has Community Cafe tomorrow? Oh my goodness, we have Community Cafe tomorrow. And we don't have so much as five barley loaves and two fish to feed the crowd that is coming to our church tomorrow. We've been having 35 to 40, almost 50 people on any given Saturday. And we have nothing in place to be able to feed this crowd who's coming to our church tomorrow at 1030 for lunch. Well, I am pleased and greatly relieved to tell you Cafe happened yesterday, thanks to the hard work and the creative uh, contributions of my family and a couple of other folks in the church, willingness to step right in and participate and to make sure that the event would take place. I, I am quite sure that had I not told our guest, they would never have known how close they came to going without lunch yesterday. They came with great gratitude and appreciation. They came humbly accepting and being grateful for the, the meal that we provided for them. In some ways, I think that crowd is a little bit like the crowd who followed Jesus one day. You remember the story of Jesus walking through the village and walking through the town and healing the sick and teaching and, and so many people gathering around Jesus, they start following him and they want to be a part of what he's doing. They want to bring their own family members who are infirmed and have Jesus heal them and to listen to what this man has to say. This crowd goes with Jesus and follows him, John says, to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They've been walking along and listening to Jesus and enjoying everything that he has to say and certainly receiving the healings. And at some point, Jesus looks at this crowd and realizes the time. And then he looks over to one of his disciples, Philip, and says, Philip, where in the world are we going to get enough food to be able to feed all of these folks? And all of a sudden, that light goes on above Philip's head and he thinks, Never mind where are we going to get the food. The real question is with what are we going to buy the food? It would take six months wages to buy enough food for all of these people. And Jesus, we don't have it. We don't have the money it would take to buy food for this crowd. Well, along about that time, another disciple, Andrew, walks up. And he has heard what is going on, and he's found this little boy, this little boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, who's willing to give it to Jesus. 
the boy gives the bread and the fish to Jesus, and Jesus takes it, he breaks it, he blesses it, and he offers it to the disciples. And then the disciples offer it to the crowds. And John tells us that everyone had something to eat. Everyone had enough to eat. They had enough to fill their stomachs. They even had 12 baskets of leftovers, John says. It's an amazing story. It's the only miracle story that you find in all four of the Gospels. It's a great story, and I am sure you have heard several sermons about the day that Jesus fed the multitude on just the the little boy's lunch. You've heard sermons about that story that tell you that it's a story about Jesus' resourcefulness and that the power that Jesus has over natural elements. You've heard that sermon. You've probably heard that sermon used on a stewardship Sunday when you were reminded if you will give what you have to God, God will be able to take your gifts and use it and multiply it so that the work of the kingdom of God can be advanced. You've heard that sermon, and all very relevant passages or sermons to that passage, but the most basic truth of that passage is that Jesus looked on a crowd and saw that they were hungry, and he fed them. The most basic truth is that Jesus was concerned about the hunger of people. And throughout the Gospels, you see that Jesus is concerned about hunger. He is concerned that people have enough food to eat. If Jesus ever met someone who who was hungry, he made some way of providing for them. If Jesus found someone who was thirsty, he found some way to provide for them. He satisfied their hunger and he quenched their thirst. Jesus was concerned about hunger and thirst, even to the point that in today's passage... In this passage from the sixth chapter of John, we hear Jesus saying that not only is he willing to give bread and living water, but he is bread. That his body is to be eaten and his blood is to be drunk. That's how concerned Jesus is. Jesus is concerned to the point of being willing to give of his body and to give of his blood. Now that is commitment to a cause, but that also is appalling. Martin Coppenhaver is the president of Andover Newton Theological School in New England. He's also one of the most gifted and creative preachers of our day. He tells the story of leading a worship service in which... The congregation was to observe the Lord's Supper. He gave his sermon, spoke about the bread and the cup, and then at the appointed time in the worship service, he stood over the table and gave those words of institution, this is my body which is broken for you, and this is my blood which is spilt for you. And in that high holy moment, some little girl back in the back says with a voice loud enough for everybody to hear, Ooh, yuck! Eating the body? Drinking the blood? Ooh, yuck! Copenhaver says that everyone in the church that day was horrified by the little girl's response to those words of institution But I would give her credit. I'd give her a little bit of credit for her honesty. It's appalling to think of eating the body and drinking the blood. And I would also thank her for reminding us that you just never can come to Jesus with a rock-solid, literalist mindset in, in your head. Now, I'm sure that once the little girl's parents overcame their embarrassment... They had a little conversation with their little girl. And perhaps later that afternoon, they tried to explain to the little girl what Jesus was saying in that passage and what the pastor was saying, that Jesus didn't really mean for us to actually eat his body or drink his blood. That's not what Jesus meant. But rather what Jesus was saying is that he wants us to to learn from him. That Jesus wants us to accept what he has to say. That Jesus wants to teach us and wants to help us learn how to live well in this life. 
explaining it in the best way that a a little four or five-year-old girl could possibly understand, that Jesus didn't want you to eat him or to drink his blood, but he wants you to learn from him and to put your, uh, your trust in Jesus and to put your faith in Jesus. Jesus wants you to know that everything that he says is right and true and that you can believe everything that he says. That's what Jesus meant. Now, that doesn't have quite the shock and awe experience of eating the body and drinking the blood. But let's pause for just a moment and and think about the impact of what it really means to listen to Jesus and to learn from Jesus and to believe that everything that Jesus said is true those are a bit more palatable, but they truly should give us a bit of pause before we sit down and dine on the words of Jesus. I'm pretty sure that none of us would hear the words of Scripture or hear the words of Jesus and respond with a, ooh, yuck. We, we wouldn't say that, but I think when we do take an honest look at our lives in relation to the words of Jesus, each of us can remember ourselves to be that little child who's sitting at the dining room table. That little child whose mother has put a good spoonful of collards on his plate. And now that child has eaten everything else. And there's still collards on that plate because they look so unappetizing. I just won't eat them, even though dessert is sitting there waiting for me. That delicious looking chocolate cake, that's what I want, but mom says I have to eat this before I can have that. Now it's a far too simple of a metaphor, and I'm really hesitant to reduce heaven and eternal life and the ethical teachings of Jesus to dessert and to vegetables, but the analogy has something to it. For heaven is what we want. Heaven is all of what we dream of. We have no real concept of the beauty and the glory of heaven and of what eternal life with God is going to be, but we know it is going to be beautiful. It is going to be peaceful. We are going to be with God, and that's all we need to know. It is glorious. But before we get there, we got to deal with some of these words and teachings that Jesus gives us. And we got we to gotta think about some of these things that Jesus says. I know Jesus tells us that God loves us, and that's good to hear. But Jesus says some other things as well. And I really wonder, do we really have to? I'm just like that child back at my home staring at that heaping, helping of collards, wondering, do I really have to eat that? Lord, do I really have to love my enemies? Do I really have to try and serve those who have harmed me in some way? Lord, do I really need to forgive the person who has wronged me? Do I need to offer them grace, the grace that you have offered me? Lord, are you really serious about grace? And really serious about me needing to forgive others. Lord, are you serious that I really need to reach out to folks who are different than me? Isn't it enough for me just to kind of let them be and and I'll live my life quietly and peacefully? Do I really need to, to engage folks who are different than I am? Is it necessary that I forfeit my prejudice in order for me to be Christian? Do I have to? There there are all kinds of questions that I have of what Jesus said because when we truly look at them and truly break them down, we realize that there are some, some hard words to digest there. Jesus, are you serious that it's more blessed to be poor and needy than it is to be rich and mighty? 
Are you sure that we are to be meek and humble rather than proud and strong and mighty? Lord, are you serious that when we feed the hungry and when we clothe the naked, when we, invisit, when we visit the incarcerated and when we mend the, those who are broken of heart or of body, that we are actually caring for you? That we're actually visiting you and feeding you and clothing you and mending you. And when we, we, when we refuse to help those who are in the least of these, that we are actually ignoring you. Are you serious about that? Our common sense tells us that Jesus didn't really mean for us to eat his body and to drink his blood. But Jesus, are you serious about these other wild ideas that you have? These ideas that are found in the Beatitudes, these ideas that are found in every moment of his life. Do we truly need to eat these words and digest them and to be nourished by them? You see, friends, it's just hard to tell sometimes when we ought to take Jesus seriously. It's just hard to figure that out. And if you're quick to say, well, we take Jesus seriously all the time, then, then take another look at some of the things that Jesus says. Jesus says some pretty outlandish things at times, and it's hard for us to figure out which of these teachings that we need to sink our teeth into and really chew on and try to digest. It's hard for us to figure out what we must eat in order to live. Now, we have said over the past few months or so that First Baptist Church is a Jesus church and that we are a Jesus people. And I am all for that. I want to be a part of a Jesus church and I want to know and to be nurtured and nourished by Jesus people. But let's remember, friends, that being Jesus people means a lot more than just being able to say I'm saved and that I know I'm going to heaven one day. It means a lot more than being able to pass by that billboard out on the interstate that says heaven or hell and knowing that I've got that, answer, that, that question answered. Being a Jesus person means a lot more than eternal salvation or eternal destiny. Being a Jesus person means to invite Jesus into your life right here, right now. And allowing Jesus Christ to be the very Lord not only of your Sunday morning, not only of your devotion time, not only of the times that you may serve in the community, but for Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life in every moment of your life. It is to invite the Spirit to govern your every thought, your emotion, your every word, and your action. To be a Jesus person is to live in communion with God, where you bear your soul before the living God and you dive into God, seeking God's heart and God's character. To be a Jesus person and to be in a Jesus church is to be nurtured and nourished and sustained by a daily dialogue with God and to be responsive to God. It is to be supple enough of spirit that you go where Jesus tells you to go and you do what Jesus tells you to do and you love who Jesus tells you to love. Now that's a phrase that I have used for years in my preaching ministry. That as Christians, we are to go where Jesus tells us to go, we are to do what Jesus tells us to do, and we are to love whom Jesus would tell us to love. It's a fine phrase, and I like repeating it, but let me remind you of a perfect picture of it. Also in the Gospel of John, you, you hear the story of Jesus having a conversation with a woman who is from Samaria. Now that was amazing, because no good self-respecting Jew would ever have a conversation with a Samaritan woman. First of all, a good self-respecting Jewish man would not have a conversation with a woman who was not his wife out in public. That was taboo. Second, you wouldn't have a conversation with a Samaritan. 
they're from the other side of the tracks, even further beyond just the tracks, but the entire land. And third, Jesus would not, or no, no good self-respecting Jew would have a conversation with a Samaritan woman who had the past that this woman had. She had been a failure in life. But Jesus must not have been a good, self-respecting Jewish man because when she comes up to get her water there at the well, he engages her in conversation. And he asks her, please give me some water. And the two start to talk about water. And Jesus introduces the idea of living water, of eternal life. And they go on in the conversation. They talk about their common ancestry. And they talk about worship. And the desire to know God. And after some conversation, Jesus turns the conversation towards her. And helps her to understand, I know all about you. I know everything that you've done. I know where you have succeeded. And I know where you have failed. I know your virtues and I know your sins and I want you to know I don't condemn you for your sins. Well, John says the woman becomes so engaged and so affirmed and so appreciative of God's grace that she meets in Jesus that she runs back to town This town that has scorned her and ridiculed her. And she tells everyone that she can find that I may have just found the Messiah. You got to come meet him. And they do. And many come to know Jesus as a result of her testimony. I love what happened in that woman's life. But as much as I love what happened in her life, I really love to see what happens in Jesus' heart in that story. As the woman went back to town to tell everybody, the disciples are coming from town back to where Jesus is. They've been on a little grocery shopping trip, getting some supplies. And once they reached Jesus, they said, Jesus, we've bought some bread and we've bought some fruit. We've bought all kinds of food for us. Want you to please, please have some. Have, some, have something to eat. You haven't eaten in a while. You need to eat, Jesus. And Jesus, John says, just refuses. And, and I can see Jesus just sitting there, having the most peaceful grin on his face. I, I'm good. I don't need a thing. And Jesus says, I have food that you don't know about. I have something that is nurturing and nourishing me and sustaining me that you don't know about. That's an amazing statement that Jesus makes because it's hard for us in our culture in our day to believe that helping a social outcast can be so satisfying that you forget your own physical hunger. But such is the difference Such is the divide between us and Jesus. And the reason why we need to take in every word the man said. And to take in every word the Spirit speaks to us today. It may be hard to put in our mouths. It may be difficult to chew on. It may not taste so good. But such is the divide. Such is the divide between God's perfection and our need. Last month, we spent some time thinking of the Old Testament prophets and hearing from them. And in light of what Jesus says today about being the body and, or the bread and the cup, I think we might do well to listen to the prophet Jeremiah. And in chapter 15, verse 16, Jeremiah says, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Friends, 
the food that we have that is not of this word, of this world. Here it is. Take and eat the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Loving and holy God, we come to you hungry. We come to you starving for truth, needing your grace, needing wisdom and understanding. Lord, I pray that we would embrace our hunger and find that the only place for which we can be satisfied is in relationship with you through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, O Lord, for the mercies that we experience in Christ and pray that as we receive them each day, that we will enjoy and celebrate being filled anew and know that you fill us to the point of being able to share with others. As we come to a moment of commitment and decision, O Lord, I ask that you guide us and that you help us to be honest with our need and our hunger and thirst for you and that we come to you in spirit and in truth and receive the living bread. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of commitment on this day is number 468, My Jesus, I Love Thee. If you would respond to God's gracious invitation to feed you through a relationship with Jesus Christ, I invite you to come. Let us stand together as we sing our response. <laughs>